So what do you do when you have a customer that wants you to make parts that really demand a five axis machine when you only have a three axis machine? Well, I can tell you that canonically, the right answer is you no quote them and you recommend that they go to someone like Nick at P3D Creations with his nice fancy Kern. But they don't call me Audacity Micro because I'm smart. I threw out a big stupid number that I knew they would never accept. But you wanna guess what they said? So I guess we're making these. And by the way, there's nine of them and they're due the day after tomorrow. Every single part is a little bit different, though there is like two clear part families that are related. So allow me to introduce you to my fifth axis. Yep, that's it. Uh, this is my plan. This call it block will let us index the part both like this, rotating around that axis, and then also standing it up straight on end. Now, how in the world is this gonna be accurate enough, you may be asking yourself? And the answer is it's not in itself. This cheap call it block is pretty good at indexing in 90 degree increments, but I do not trust it to keep the part in the same place positionally. And that is where my friend, Mr. OMP40 comes into play. Basically, we'll just brute force accuracy by probing everything to death. To make matters even more interesting, this is beryllium copper, and it's what we're gonna be making the parts out of. A fun thing about beryllium is that it'll kill you. Fortunately, this is not beryllium beryllium, this is beryllium copper. It is mostly copper with a little bit of beryllium alloyed in. This stuff is not nearly as dangerous, but I will be taking some basic precautions. And shout out to Dylan from Proteum Machining and the Within Tolerance podcast. He heard me talking about this on my podcast, Taps and Patience and informed me that it was potentially toxic. I had no clue. So thank you, Dylan, for helping save a life. In terms of negative health effects, there seems to be two major risks. One, and the big one, is breathing it or consuming it somehow. And the second one is skin to contact. Skin contact doesn't seem to be a problem unless you're like working with this stuff all the time. I don't work with this stuff all the time, but I do plan on being a machinist for like the rest of my life. So I'm gonna take proper precautions and whenever I'm handling it, I'm gonna wear gloves. In terms of breathing it, I don't need to wear a respirator as long as I'm not making dust. Copper chips do not suspend themselves in the air like grinding dust does. So I don't need to wear a respirator when I'm machining it. And to avoid accidental consumption, I will of course not be eating or drinking anything while I work. So goodbye coffee, bye. And lastly, I'll clean out my machine really well, both before and after working with this material so it doesn't stick around unknowingly in my shop. From my understanding with those fairly reasonable precautions, there won't be any risk of long-term health effects. Another fun fact about the Brilliant Copper is it's about $15 an inch. So we're gonna do a test run out of aluminum on one of the parts just to get everything dialed in and then make sure our process works before stepping up to the more expensive material. Thanks to all the traveling I've done lately, like my trip to Tormach, I haven't finished the cam yet or started it, but I do have a plan. So this right here is our part. And then this is just the stock that is modeled. If we go to the top view, you can see that I have a little bit of a tab modeled in here so that we don't remove the part prematurely. The big challenge on our part is this radius right here. That has to be a sharp 90 degree angle that can't have a radius in it. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the actual customer parts. They're all covered under NDAs. So what I've done is I've designed my own part that doesn't inherit any of the features from the actual parts, but is similar in machining challenges. It'll use all of the same tool paths and strategies that I'll use on the real deal. When it's time to make the real parts out of the copper, I will just swap the correct model in, regenerate my tool paths and hit go on my machine. I shouldn't need to set any new tools or tweak cam or change my fixture. It should just work. It took me a minute to work through the logistics of this in my mind. So I started off by just programming the probing operations to help me think through how I'm gonna make this part. So op one, we're gonna do in this orientation, so Z's up like that. Then we're gonna rotate 90 degrees to, to this orientation. And this surface will be finished for probing, this surface will be finished for probing, and this surface will be finished for probing. 
that gets us our three different faces that we need to establish a XYZ coordinate system. Then we're gonna rotate another 90 degrees. And again, we'll have three different faces that we can probe. Do that just one more time to square off some inside corners and to drill and tap this hole. And we're golden. With one click on the torque wrench here, our setup is complete. This is our pseudo fourth axis. We have the collet block in a vise. There's plenty of room to stick material out the end, so this should be fairly material efficient. And now we just need to set our work coordinate system. The program has a probing routine that'll dial it in all the way. Right now, we just need to get close. And I think, I think I'm just gonna eyeball it. Does that look centered to you? I think it looks centered to me. All right, let's see how this goes, starting with probing. We're already probing too deep. Okay, that was just a programming mistake. It was doing exactly what I told it, but let's try this again. This time it should be closer to the center of the bar. Yeah, there we go. And now we're gonna probe for the center of the material. So I believe it starts by finding the top center. Nope, it starts by finding the left right center. After it finds the left right center, it's gonna find the top center. Because now it knows where the middle of the bar is. Now that it knows where the middle of the bar is, it's gonna find the top center. And then we're gonna use that information to recursively go back and do the same measurement again. We should get a little bit more accurate this time. Because now we know where the, the centers are left and right wise. Is it a waste of time? Maybe, but it will just make sure everything is nicely, nicely centered up. I suppose it really doesn't matter in an op one though. All right, and now we start roughing. And I will be watching very clear or very carefully for call it clearances. Hopefully there's enough stick out. It should be about as bad as it gets. And that's it. That felt too easy. This was like cheating. Nothing went wrong, no broken tools. Finishes are good, it sounded good. Yeah. All right, well, step one is done. Now, if some of those speeds and feeds felt slow to you, they were, and that's because these are my copper speeds and feeds, not my aluminum speeds and feeds. Remember, the final part is actually going to be copper, and I don't really want to have to go back and change my speeds and feeds later. This one may take a couple extra minutes, but that's not the end of the world. The thing that's going to get me on this project is going to be orientation, because I have to rotate this part four different times, and if I ever rotate it in the wrong direction, I'm in trouble. So believe me, between every step, I'm going to be like triple checking my cam. Like I mentioned before, I'm making nine different parts, but there's like three different sets of parts and they all kind of share some common attributes. And I, I've kind of given them my own names for my own sanity while working on this. This right here, I'm calling the axle, and this part right here, I'm calling the arm. So if I ever refer to the axle, it's this big part here that I think is vertical in the implementation of the part. And if I ever refer to the arm, it's the little thing coming out the side. So this next machining step needs to be axle pointed down, and the arm needs to be oriented up, which is just a 90 degree rotation in that direction.
And I'm going to try to put the call it block roughly back in the same place. I'm referencing the top of this call it block against the side of my vise there. This would be a good time to have a full sized vise, but I don't have a full sized vise. And make sure that it's on the parallels. On the parallels. And we should be good to probe in the next part. So it might be hard to see, but I am now, I rotated the call block 90 degrees and we're machining another side of it. So this part should be four ops when it's done. I'm sorry, you can't see that. I know that doesn't work. You'll see it at the end though, and it'll be exciting because this is, I, I'm very happy with this process. I could probably turn up rapids now. There we go. And there's another one down. Man, this is going too smoothly. Granted, I haven't actually measured anything, but I thought these parts would be super hard and I would run into a lot of troubleshooting on this weird five axis part on a three axis mill. But so far, this is going pretty well. Now this is where we may go wrong. I need to do a 180 degree flip and the scary part is we have to use a really long extended reach 1 8 inch end mill. And I'm worried that will screw up our finishes. But we'll find out. So now we are starting to get somewhere. You can kind of see what I'm going for. The part of this part that really made it difficult is this corner right here needed to be sharp. I couldn't have a radius in there. And that is the whole reason we have ended up going through all this rigmarole. So now there's just one last operation with the Z axis coming from this direction. Ew, yeah. This right here is where that long tool was cutting and those finishes are not good. I'll have to do something about that. And there is our finished part. I haven't measured it yet but it doesn't look terrible except for that place that I mentioned. On the actual parts, I'll just sand off the tab on the back. That's not hard. Now I just need to figure out what to do with some of these bad finishes. Actually, it's just, it's all caused by that one tool. I need to see if I can work around that because that is not gonna fly. I just did some measurements and dimensionally we're doing all right. The only thing that's close is the width of the arm here it's about five thou too big. Everything else is shockingly within about a thou. I just retouched off the tool that finished the face that was out of spec. And the offset did change in length by about two thou, maybe two and a half thou. That's not quite enough to compensate for all of the air, but that would get it within three thou, which is definitely within spec. Plus or minus five on these parts. Other than that, I just need to change the section of this that has bad finishes due to that long tool, um, which I might be able to just do with speeds and feeds and some rearranging of how I do tool paths. I finished up my last few cam changes and I think it's time for the real deal now. 
I measured and cut this material so that it would be the longest that it could be without risking hitting this part of the enclosure. That way I can just kind of keep sliding it forwards like a bar feeder every time we part off a piece. And I shouldn't lose anything to the amount that we have to stick out from the end of the collet to provide clearance for the um, collet nut on the tool holder. This should maximize our material usage with relatively little waste, basically just the width of this tool. We're getting to the point of this project where I can't show you the parts up close, plus I kind of really need to focus and get these things knocked out. So I'm just gonna put you in time-lapse mode and I will talk to you again if there are any problems. So future AJ here, I recorded this like months ago and I'm just getting around to editing it now. Those parts actually went fairly smoothly. There were two things that I had to change going forward that I hadn't already mentioned. One, in the first two or three ops, I had to be super, super, super on top of tolerances. I found that errors would stack pretty rapidly over the course of the machining because we're machining the reference surfaces based off of other reference surfaces based on other reference surfaces. And if there was a problem with the first one, that would cascade down, getting worse and worse as we went. The other thing I did was modify my probing so that as much as I could, it was only probing surfaces that I machined in that first op. That minimized some of the, the tolerance or the air stack up over time and led to much better parts. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.